we can start to start to pull it together here for a sec. If we could take our seats and wrap up conversation. My name is Charlie Copeland, and I'm the president of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and I want to welcome you all here uh, this evening. We are uh, streaming this with Facebook Live, and so we would like everybody who is so inclined to share this event, so you go to the ISI's Facebook page and let your friends know that you're here. And since I'm looking out at this crowd, and I know I saw lots and lots of these little PDA, sort of technological whiz-bang devices called a smartphone, if you could just take your moment right now, come on, pull it out, get the Facebook app going. I know the Facebook app eats a lot of, uh, a lot of RAM and a lot of memory, but you know, just go ahead, share it so that people know you're here and that we're here. So thank you. So welcome to tonight's debate. Uh, technology should treat death as an enemy. This debate is a result of a partnership between the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and the Abigail Adams Institute, uh, along with the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation. The purpose of the partnership is to sponsor a debate on an issue of major importance to the contemporary West. The Intercollegiate Studies Institute is a nationwide, higher education-based nonprofit focused on ensuring that bright, deep-thinking, intellectually curious, conservative and libertarian students have a chance to discover, embrace, and advance the principles and virtues that make America free and prosperous. Across this country, on college campuses of all stripes, free and open debates and thought are, more often than not, suppressed in the mistaken theory that being ignorant and happy is better than being intelligent with your eyes open. So if you enjoy debate like this one and you want to see more free speech, that challenges your thoughts and for forces you to sharpen your own thinking, please consider joining and or supporting ISI. If you are a student, a faculty member, or perhaps an ISI alumni, or even just somebody who wants to learn more about those foundational ideas, you can go to uh, uh, join.isi.org and, and join as a student member or faculty or alumni or, or other. Um, if your campus does not have an ISI society, please contact uh, Thomas Pack. Thomas, where, right over there, Thomas Pack. Uh, and get, get one started on your campus. It, it's your life, it's your education, and it's your brain. Uh, so what are you waiting for? If you'd like to support ISI, you can just go to isi.org, isi.org, just seven characters, right? And, and click that donate button. ISI builds and supports an intellectual community that wants this community wants to think, live free. So to tonight's debate, the moderator tonight is, uh, is Dr. Petronovich. Uh, he is the director of the Abigail Adams Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The Institute provides supplementary humanistic education to the Harvard intellectual community by exploring questions of deep human concern that cut across the boundaries of academic disciplines. Previously, Dr. Petronovich has taught political science at Duke University and Yale University. He is currently writing a book contracted with the Yale University Press about the three-decade duel between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas, which resulted in a fundamental transformation of American nationhood. Dr. Petronovich is a frequent public speaker in the Boston area and in the, at the colleges and universities and lectures on subjects ranging from Aristotle's best regime and American founding to the foundations of political economy and Alexis de Tocqueville's politics and sociology. He is frequently seen in Harvard's Kirkland House where he is a dedicated member of the senior common room. Daniela? Thank you, Charlie, for that introduction. And uh, thank you to the Intercollegiate Studies Institute for partnering with us to put on today's event. Um, thank you to the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation for making this a bountiful event. And more personally, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Thomas Pack who, uh, for his leadership in pulling this event together. Thank you, Thomas. The Great Ideas debate this evening raises the question concerning the essence of technology. Resolved that technology should treat death as an enemy. As we all know, 
technological progress has brought impressive, sometimes astounding, improvements in our lives. The forward-looking nature of modern man has inspired feats never imagined by men of different eras. We've cured diseases, discovered worlds, built cities, powered economies, invented machines, mastered more of nature. But as more has been seen to be possible, some people have become squeamish and uneasy about various new applications of tech to life. Concerns about the ethics and morality of the technological dispensation are now voiced from the traditional left as well as the right. Even in the United States, heretofore the most tech bullish of Western nations. So how are we to think about the essence and purpose of technology? What are the principles, passions, and interests informing these conversations? Can we better integrate technology to serve human ends? And what should it have to do with that great primal truth of death? All right, well, those are some of my own framings and questions. Our first rate, fantastic debaters will naturally set the agenda in the way that best suits their purposes. Peter Thiel will speak first in defense of the resolution. Then, after some back and forth with Professor Hurlbut, which will go on for 30 or 40 minutes, I suspect, you, the audience, will have a chance to submit your questions. So you should have, or you'll be getting soon, the four by six um, cards uh, that our team will be distributing. And Anne and uh, Gabby will be doing that. They're coming down. Please write legibly and bigly and be succinct so that I can read them and uh, incorporate them in the uh, uh, conversation. So um, that's it, the speaker's introductions. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, these gentlemen, you can find them online. They're, 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 um, uh, you, can, you can find them uh, easily. Um, <laughs> William B. Hurlbut is consulting professor in the Department of Neuro Neurobiology at the Stanford Medical Center. After receiving his undergraduate and medical training at Stanford, Bill completed postdoctoral studies in theology and medical ethics. His primary areas of interest involve the ethical issues associated with advancing biomedical technology, the biological basis of moral awareness, and studies in the integration of theology with the philosophy of biology. He's the author of numerous publications on science and ethics, including the co-edited volume, Altruism and Altruistic Love, Science, Philosophy, and Religion in Dialogue. Bill is also, uh, was also co-chair of two interdisciplinary faculty projects at Stanford, Becoming Human, The Evolutionary Origins of Spiritual, Religious, and Moral Awareness, and Brain, Mind, and Emergence. In addition to teaching at Stanford, Bill has al also worked with NASA on projects in astrobiology and was a member of the Chemical and Biological Warfare Working Group at the Center for International Security and Cooperation. From 02 to 09, Bill served on the President's Council on Bioethics. Welcome, Bill. And Peter Thiel is an entrepreneur and investor. He started PayPal in 1998, led it as a CEO, and took it public in 2002, defining the new era of fast and secure online commerce. In 04, he made the first outside investment in Facebook, where he serves as a director. The same year, he launched Palantir Technologies, a software company that harnesses computers to empower human analysts in fields like national security and global finance. He has provided early funding for LinkedIn, Yelp, and dozens of successful technology startups, many run by former colleagues who have been dubbed, quote, the PayPal Mafia. He's partner of Founders Fund, a Silicon Valley venture capital firm that has funded companies like SpaceX and Airbnb. And he started the Teal Fellowship, which ignited a national debate by encouraging young people to put learning before schooling. And he leads the Teal Foundation, which works to advance technological progress and long-term thinking about the future. Peter is also the number one New York best-selling author of Zero to One, Notes on Startups, or How to Build the Future. Thank you for your patience. And now I turn it to Peter. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, should I stand for my opening or I'll sit, or what do you prefer? Perhaps sit, if you don't okay, mind. OK, great. Uh, and uh, Bill uh, and I have been friends for decades uh, out in out in California, so it's, uh, it's really terrific that uh, we're going to be able to do this event tonight and hopefully uh, um, have a wide-ranging discussion because this is a this is sort of a very broad topic. There's you know there's obviously sort of a question about 
what's going on in science and technology and, 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 uh, and uh, biotechnology, what uh, should be going on, what, what the arc of, uh, of, of progress looks like. And, uh, and, uh, I, and then, of course, it's all also what this, you know, what does this have to do with larger questions about the meaning of life, you know, the, uh, the arc of the West, of, the, of Western civilization. I, I think that, uh, I think, you know, one of the ways I think these, see these, this whole bundle is very positively linked, is that, you know, early modernity, modern science, uh, was, was focused on this question, um, the, the relief of man's estate, that life should be more than um, nasty, brutish, and short, that, uh, you know, Francis Bacon, Benjamin Franklin, they, they were all sort of very, uh, very intensely, uh, intensely concerned with this. And, and, you know, a tremendous amount of progress was reached, as you, as you pointed out, in, in, in the centuries. And, you know, from, you know, 1840 onwards, um, you know, life expectancy was increased by something like two to two and a half years um, a decade in, uh, in the Western world in a, in a, in a nearly, um, in a nearly linear fashion from something like, you know, 46 in 1840 to like high 80s in, in Sweden or Scandin um, Scandinavia or, or, or Japan um, um, uh, for, for women. Um, and, and, um, and, the, and yet the question, I, I think we have to start with, if we were to be honest, is that uh, things are not quite that healthy uh, today, that, uh, that uh, in recent decades, uh, the progress has been frustratingly slow. You know, Nixon declared war on cancer in 1971. Uh, 48 uh, years later, um, you know, we're 48 years closer to the goal, but uh, it doesn't feel like we're gonna defeat it in five years, which was the initial goal. It's gonna be defeated by the American bicentennial of uh, 1976. Uh, and so there's been you know, very slow progress. You know, a number of other kinds of diseases, uh, uh, it feels like uh, we're completely stuck on things like dementia, um, Alzheimer's, th things like that. Um, and then um, perhaps even more disturbingly, in, uh, in recent years, uh, we've actually uh, seemed to have taken some steps backward where uh, we've had this uh, you know, really shocking fact of uh, declining life expectancy in the, in the United States, not other Western countries, but, uh, but the U.S. And it's, uh, it's again, sort of this uh, complex web of uh, you know, um, scientific, technological, but also spiritual and cultural failures. You know, it's uh, obesity, opioid addictions, suicides, you know, a whole range of things that are uh, contributing to this, this very strange trend. Now, you know, I, I'm not gonna argue that, uh, you know, the quantity of life is the same as quality, precisely, but, uh, but I do think there, these things are proxies for one another, and uh, one of the reasons quantity is, is a good thing to focus on is that it's easier to measure, it's more precise. And so when, things are, when, we, when people's lives are shorter, uh, are getting shorter, we have a sense that something is deeply wrong and that our, you know, our society is, is very sick. Um, I, think, uh, you know, I think that uh, you know, one way that you could rephrase the resolution in, in sort of a more practical way is, um, with respect to any single disease, should we be doing more? Should we be doing more on cancer? Should we be doing more on Alzheimer's? Should we be doing more for um, grandma? Should we be doing more for arthritis? And, uh, and it, it strikes me that the, you know, the, the moral answer is, always to, is almost always going to be yes on all these, uh, all these specific particulars. The, uh, the, um, and this is, sort of a, this is something that's, I think, somewhat new about uh, sort of the frontier of medicine today and, and, and different from, let's say, 17th, 18th, 19th century, where you could say uh, um, that the frontier was not quite as linked with uh, questions of aging and mortality and death. It was, you know, you had infant mortality was a serious problem, or you had, you know, sort of these uh, massive infectious diseases like bu bubonic plague or, you know, um, um, tuberculosis or th things like that that sort of uh, affected people pretty independent of age, whereas today, the, um, the, the really big killers, and again, I'm focused on the West, on the United States, Western Europe, the big, the big killers here are, um, are these uh, epidemics of, of, of old age. You know, cancer is a disease where you have a, you have a one in a thousand chance of getting it when you're 30 years old. You have a one in 10 chance of getting it when you're 80 in the, in the next year of your life. Um, you know, uh, same with dementia, same with arthritis, heart disease. All these things are, are you know, highly correlated with aging, and that's why I think that if we are going to tackle these diseases seriously, we have to also think about this question of aging and mortality. They're, 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 they're incredibly tightly, deeply linked, and, uh, and uh, they, they need to be you know, studied, studied a lot more. One, uh, one other way I, I would reframe the resolution is, uh, you know, um, technology should be a death as an enemy, is technology should destroy death or should learn why it can't do that. Science and technology should either destroy it or we should, we should, um, we should learn 
of why we can't do it. And, um, and sort of the, you know, I think the sort of a pessimistic account would be, well, it's just impossible. It's an impossible task. And, uh, and this is where I'm, you know, some, somewhat a little bit more on the optimistic side. I think, uh, I think we have no idea. We have no idea what really drives these things. We have no idea whether, you know, it's, it's um, in our, there's some sort of genetic code that automatically means that we're going to die or whether uh, these things can be fixed and to what extent they can be fixed. Uh, certainly, it's progressed more than people would have thought in 1840. You know, there was more progress possible. Uh, and then I, I would submit we have, we have no idea. I think that the problems are um, not ones of nature, but are, are ones of, of culture, that we have, uh, that the, uh, the problem with the culture of science today is not Promethean hubris. You know, we're not, we're not in the world of Los Alamos in 1945. Um, we're in a world of um, Epicurean um, hedonism, Epicurean complacency, where uh, the dominant idea is, is um, that there's not much you can do, you should just accept it, you should accept uh, the stagnation of your lives, the stagnation of the West, you should accept the idea that the younger generation will do less well than their parents, um, and that's sort of the, the light motif of our time. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I think we can probably find all kinds of evil forms of science, that we think shouldn't happen, and, and you know, I'm, I don't think we should be doing Nazi experiments or uh, CCP experiments, or um, you know, I'm not sure we should be doing Dr. Frankenstein experiments. But uh, but that's not that's not really what's going on in our world. What's the dominant thing that's going on is uh, is nothing at all, and it's it's, it's sort of this 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 senescence um, of, uh, of of scientific culture. It's uh, uh, you know the the uh, uh, by, 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 by one measure, we have about 100 times as many scientists today as we had in 1920, about 100 times as many people with PhDs. On a most generous count, um, progress is about at the same rate as, as then, probably quite a bit slower. And so the productivity of these people has gone, has gone way down. I think, <coughs> and I think it's not because we've hit natural limits. I think it's because there's something deeply wrong with the university culture, with the academic culture, with the um, sort of uh, peer review funding culture where you can only do incremental things. There's no room for heterodox thought, no room for, uh, for, for really big breakthroughs. And so it's, uh, it's, I see it as linked to this sort, of, um, this sort of cultural thing. If we look at sort of the, the big aspects of stagnation in our society more generally, you know, it's um, the, the sort of addictions and the diseases. It's like, you know, it's marijuana, it's opioids, it's, uh, it's you know, too much yoga, it's, uh, it's uh, <laughs> To, um, people uh, locked up in their 20s living in basements playing video games. And these are, these are not the diseases of an accelerating technological civilization. They're the diseases of a stagnating civilization where the stagnation dominates it. You know, I mean, you know Los Alamos, people probably took too many amphetamines. And, and, you know, in the 1960s, people smoked cigarettes because you needed nicotine so you could work harder and be smarter. Those are not the problems we have today. They're sort of very, very different. So I think, I think it's always <coughs> this question of stagnation what we can do to get out of it. And because the stagnation is, is cultural, um, this, it's a difficult problem to solve, but you know, it's ultimately something that I think is, is possible. And I think you know, the, the kinds of um, counterpoints that uh, Dr. Hurlbut will make will be some version of it's not about culture, it's about nature. And you can sort of have nature in two forms. You can have nature as a limit or nature as a standard. That uh, you know, there are limits that nature has set and we shouldn't overstep them. Or, um, or it's sort of a, um, a standard um, that tells us what's, uh, what, what's right in, in, in some sense or other. Um, and uh, you, know, I, I often, you know, I often think this argument was in some ways summarized um, by Shakespeare when he uh, said that all that lives must die, which is sort of a, a statement about um, um, a description of the world, this is just nature, and it's also a, uh, a normative description. It's, it's, it's right that it's this way, and this is the way things should be. But uh, if you look at the original Shakespeare, of course, Shakespeare never said anything in his own name. It was all the characters. And the character who said that in Shakespeare was Gertrude in Hamlet, who was the evil mother. And it was an evil thing to say because um, she was trying to get Hamlet not to pay attention to how his dad had died under mysterious circumstances, how she was indifferent to it. And, uh, and so when, when we say that all that lives must die, we have to always ask, is this a statement about nature or natural limits, or is it a uh, rationalization of the rottenness that is Denmark or the rottenness that is um, um, the university uh, academic uh, research system in, uh, in 2019? Um, um, so I, th I think, uh, and, and so I think you know, we, we, 
because coming back to this culture question, I think that uh, you know we have this this uh, this alib that nature. In, the worry I have is that it's an alibi for what's gone wrong. It's like people would like to rationalize things, uh, and the scientists that have not made progress on cancer, you know, they like to say we didn't get enough money. No, they got plenty of money. Uh, this, the next line of defense is nobody could have done better. It's just too hard a problem, and I think we should be skeptical of these of these uh, of these alibis and these rationalizations, and that's that's sort of fundamentally the way uh, the way these things uh, these things work in our society. Um, you know, let me. Um, let me end with sort of a, uh, um, a theological point. You know, I know both Bill and I are, are, are Christian, and I think there's always sort of this question about um, how, uh, how this, uh, this set of ideas intersects with, uh, with, with Christianity in, in various ways. And the, uh, the, um, the understanding I would, I would give is that, uh, um, you know, Orthodox Christ Christianity, Christ is a healer. He heals the blind, the deaf, the lame. He, um, he doesn't follow all the pharisaical rules in doing so. He does it on, sun, on, on the Sabbath. He will do it, uh, um, he will do it, you know, and, and, it, it, and he will do it in all these ways that are very uncomfortable. Um, you know, healing, the, the communities are used to people being sick. They want them to stay sick. That's, that was sort of the cultural context. And Christ does not care about the cultural context. And yes, uh, and there's no limit to it. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it includes resurrecting Lazarus, um, or it includes um, the story of Enoch and Elijah in the Old Testament where you do not die at all. So there is no limit. The greatest good um, is, um, is, is, um, is, is eternal life, and there's, uh, there's, there's no limit at all. I think that uh, Christ is not some kind of Epicurean philosopher where you sort of think, uh, think uh, through your death and rationalize your death. And it's not interested in, um, in this sort of rationalization. It's not interested and um, you know, explaining um, away the uh, the evil, uh, philosophizing, rationalizing evil. Um, the, um, um, the 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 interest of the biblical God of Christ is in destroying evil, um, destroying death, and I think we should uh, we should uh, work really hard to do the same. Thank you. All right, well, I don't have much to disagree with or anything to disagree with with that. Um, but the, the interesting challenge tonight is to, is to speak into the, the title, which is, should technology regard death as an enemy? And, and so, of course, I'm a physician, after all. I agree with all of those comments about overcoming disease and breaking social constraints that provoke disease. It's interesting we're having this conversation this week because as you, maybe most of you are too young to know this, but Peter and I know this is tax week. Um, and so, you know, death and taxes, and so can we get rid of death and just have taxes left? <laughs> it's also Holy Week, a week where we traditionally pause to consider the, the meaning of our life, our mortal life, our death, and of course, um, one week from today is, is Good Friday. Um, so it's a very poignant conversation to have in this context. So some years back, I, I had an opportunity to talk with a woman who was 104 years old, and it was very fascinating. She was very articulate, very sound in body and mind. She, she could walk well. She could think well. And, and she told me that the happiest years of her life were after she turned 80, because after that she stopped worrying about dying young. <laughs> so, but then she got a little wistful, and she said, but my husband died 56 years ago. All of my children have died, and all of my grandchildren have died. What a poignant reality. We, we dwell in this amazing drama of life and death. Abraham Lincoln made the memorable f comment that we suffer the brutal bombardment by the silent artillery of time. Wow, what a phrase that is. By its very nature, living being is precarious being passionate 
and purposeful. Only by effort do we hold on to existence over and against the forces of destruction and death. Everything material decays, even non-living things decay. Individual organisms die, but whole species also dies, also die. Some of them live for as long as a couple hundred million years, but eventually they die out, at least historically. And last time I was in Boston, one of my former students took me to the Park Church Cemetery, Revolutionary War Cemetery, and I noted that even the tombstones were dying. So something about this reality stirs us at the very core. Something in us rebels. We sense that we were not made to die, that we have a transcendent purpose and a transcendent destiny. Michael Toth said, everyone wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Astonishing advances in biomedicine through understanding the material mechanisms, mathematical uh, modeling, so forth, have brought us amazing advances in putting into effect the Enlightenment dream, explicitly stated, as Peter said, by Francis Bacon and, and um, Rene Descartes. So, so now we have come to see all of living nature as mere matter and information to be reshuffled and reassigned in projects of the human will. We're ready, many of us, to entrust ourselves to the Google gods in the confidence that aging and even death may have a technological solution. William Hazeltine, founder of Genome Sciences, at the founding of the Society for, Gen for um, Regenerative Medicine commented, the real goal is to keep people alive forever. Why not? Currently, our, our armamentorium of pharmaceuticals targets about 250 protein sites. There are an estimated 20,000 protein coding genes, which means there are thousands and thousands of protein sites yet untouched. What might be possible with all that? And certainly, as Peter said, it's unknown. What could happen? So we barely, if, if you think of technology as a continent, we've barely stepped off of Plymouth Rock. Yet when we pause to consider more deeply this whole arena, it's clear that the advances that are, seem so dramatic to us of the 20th century were largely accomplished through kind of intelligible operations on the natural world. Sanitation, improved nutrition, um, very e easy to understand targeting of external infectious agents operating on us. So this, this preserved a sense of the order of nature. We were basically attacking those things which were impinging on us, not reworking the very center and core of ourselves, and therefore, the biblical statement of life three score and ten or by reason of strength four score um, can be said to be true still. Except that we've got a little more advanced and there are some people living, it seems like the maximal lifespan is about 115, 120. And by the way, it's interesting, in, uh, look in Genesis 6-3 and it says that, that God proclaims that his spirit will dwell in human beings only to the 120 years, very quite fascinating. So what is going on here? Well, do we have the possibility of intervening to not just conquer terrible diseases, but to actually extend our lifespan dramatically more and perhaps by some lights even conquer death itself? Well, if you look at the actual science undergirding all this, it's a little more complicated we use these very simplistic models, the idea that, like a car with replaceable parts. But in cars, the moving parts interact with, you know, two or three interlocking parts. That's about it. Whereas the 50 trillion cells of the human body have perhaps as many as 10 million active types of molecules that 
interact at an estimated three billion chemical interactions a second. So we're talking about something quite different than the machine model. Moreover, each cell is part of tissues and tissues parts of organs, systems within subsystems, hormones, circadian rhythms, cycles within cycles and cycles within seasons, all within the coordinated coherence of an integrated unity of an organic being. We are quite a bit more complicated than anything we use for a model. And it's moreover clear that we are constructed by time. We dwell in time, but we're made by time. The very process of our developmental biology is scaffolded, and the scaffolds are removed, and the architectures remain. You can't simply just pick things out and put things back in without the dynamic processes of development that have formed them. And when we look back at the history of life, it's clear, moreover, that evolutionary process has not been indifferent to the notion of longevity. From bacteria, we gained a million-fold in lifespan. From multicellular life, we gained a thousand-fold. Mammals live vastly longer than other creatures on average, and have some exceptions. Human being, uh, primates live longer, and human beings live longer than the average primate. So nature has actually favored longevity in a complex organism such as the human person. So we may already possibly be the culmination of the combination of organic complexity and longevity. It may be that our medicine is on its way slowly, but we're getting there, to perfecting the creature in its full inherent lifespan potential. It's a, it's a sort of a hard concept to, to grasp that we could be a physically perfectible creature for the lifespan we are made for, and that's it, with no other further options. Some things do get perfected in existence, for example, the spoon. So why not humans? Huh? <laughs> but more deeply, the lifespan has co-evolved with our sense of meaning, the context and contours of our natural limitations. We are psychophysical unity, inseparable in body and mind, located and given meaning within the exigencies of time. We, by our very nature, have a sense of a narrative arc, an autobiographical sense of story about who we are and what we are, why we are. We have the sense that we are somehow encased within our natural lives in the exigencies of their necessities and the opportunities of their relationships, and that it is that within the context of time that gives our life meaning. The Roman physician Galen said, the physician is only nature's assistant. And by this idea, it could be that our technology will pose the possibility of superhumanization, but might actually end up dehumanizing us, something we need to take quite seriously. The cure could be worse than the disease. Do we really want to stay alive by head transplants or cryopreservation? Do we want to harvest the young in, in the form of embryonic cells or fetal cells, tissues, or organs just to promote lengthened human life? It's a strange dilemma, isn't it? And yet we also know that by some mystery we are co-creators within the operations of the world, that we, whatever else happened, we operate on the world like no creature ever did. And John Stuart Mill, speaking of the idea that the world was created by a supreme goodness, a benef beneficent deity, he said, nor can any such person, whatever kind of religious phrases he may use, fail to believe that if nature and man are both the works of a being of perfect goodness, that being intended nature as a scheme to be amended, not imitated by man. So we must ask ourselves at the foundation of this discussion, what is the relationship between the given and the good? I agree. Life is to be cherished, and death is to be the ultimate enemy. We have that on good authority. 
for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Yet it is equally clear it is a spiritual transformation, not a purely technical operation on our corporeal being. I tell you this, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Martin Luther King said, if there's nothing you will die for, you've never really been alive. And St. Augustine said, he hath made us for himself. Our hearts are restless until they rest in him. Well, thank you, Bill, and thank you for those opening statements. I will um, ask uh, Gabby and Ann to collect the first round of your questions, and while they're doing that, I will uh, let, let Peter uh, respond, and then Bill will have another go at it, and uh, we continue. Thank you. Well, there's uh, so, so much in there. Um, you know, I, I, the, the, the emotional response I'm tempted to give is something that whenever someone mentions Darwin's theory of evolution, I should reach for a revolver or something like that. Um, because, uh, you know, it's, 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 we're, we're not talking about the evolution of trilobites or, uh, you know, different populations of speckled moths or uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs here. We're talking about human beings. And there's always a question, you know, how far one should apply evolutionary logic, the evolutionary paradigm, to, uh, to humans. Um, you know, certainly in a business context, whenever someone mentions evolution, they're about to do something extremely cruel. They're about to fire somebody for no good reason at all. And, uh, and, uh, and then I, that's, that's sort of what, 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 that, uh, what that, uh, that makes me think of, you know. Um, yes, there is some continuity between um, humans and other animals. Uh, there also are discontinuities. Uh, one, of the, one of the great discontinuities is that, uh, is that we are aware of our deaths. We are aware that this is going to happen. You know, I still remember when, this, when I first experienced this as a three-year-old child who's sitting on this uh, rug in my parents' apartment building, and it was sort of a, you know, I said, it was, oh, where, where did the rug come from? It was the skin of a cow. What happened to the cow? The cow died. Um, this was extremely disturbing. Um, and, but I can't, I, you can't go back to when I was two years old. I can't become a cow. Um, and, um, and I don't think, but I don't, I don't think, I also don't think any of these naturalistic frameworks work for rationalizing death. I don't think, you know, the cruelty of Darwinism um, works. I don't think the madness of Nietzsche, who, you know, try to bring back nature. It's like we live in a, a scientific technological world, and Nietzsche said, we need to bring back nature. We need to make the world more cruel. We need to, need, need to go back to that. I, I don't think those are, those are the possibilities. And yes, there are all these um, sort of mythological stories that we've told in, in, our, in our world about how the meaning of life is death. You know, um, you know ideological myths tell us um, you can't break some eggs Make, make an animal without breaking some eggs. That's Vladimir Lenin. You know, uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, you know the uh, nationalist myths tell us that it's sweet and fitting to die for your country. That's Horace, classical you know Greco-Roman world. Um, you know, um, sort of non-Christian religious myths tell you that you should worship the ancestral, the spirits of the dead, th things like that. But I, I I don't think I don't think that works anymore. That that's not where meaning is to be found. You know, meaning is not to be found in death. Yeah, I'm with that. I, I think he, I completely agree with that. And moreover, even if you look at it naturalistically, you have to acknowledge that, as Peter said, human beings are in vast discontinuity with so much of what else you can see in nature. It's as though we're trying to understand ourselves in terms of something that is less than ourselves, which is a big mistake. Yes, of course, we're biological beings, and we have to live according, we have to re survive and we have to reproduce. We also are mysteriously mental or ideational or spiritual. If you look at the thrust of, of historical life process, there is, there is a trend not just toward longer life and cephalization with its capable mental capacities, but at the human level, at least, there is the emergence of the mind in its mental operations, not just its fixed action pattern reactions, 
We are the creature that can conceptualize uh, essences that we can, I better be careful here, Peter's trained in philosophy, he may come after me on that, but um, he, it's, it's clear that we, that we lift ourselves mentally above the flow of the natural world to the realm of ideas. We don't just see the pixels or the patterns, we get the picture. And that picture is ideas. We're a creature that actually operates not according to re reactions so much as principles, principles of ideas. And that culminates in, in a kind of a spiritual nature, which is, places us in a very mysterious spot, being both, both physical beings with, with a mind and a heart that longs for something of transcendent order. I, I agree, we need to leave, at some levels, we need to leave the evolutionary paradigm behind, at least in thinking beyond it. Uh, well, so a lot, a lot we can talk about. I, let's, one, you know, one, one. As, I, I do think that you know, we 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 live in a mental, spiritual world, and uh, and there's always, you know, it's 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 both, uh, you know, mind mind and body. Uh, and you know, one one thought I have on the sort of mental part of it is that it's uh, it's profoundly teleological. It it involves. Um, it involves stories about the future, about how the, our future world will will look and um, and 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 will um, and will function, and and it is uh, there's stories about how our st our stories are not going to end, um, and if you if you try to to warp that and, and destroy that, you destroy the teleology, and this, this is probably one of the things that's sort of. At the, at the heart of the cultural malaise of the West is there's no longer a teleology. There's no longer the sense of a limitless, open future, you know, of our society, um, of, of you know, that the things we do will 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 last forever in, in some sense. Um, and that um, and so I, I yes I, I agree with this, but I think I think it's always super tightly linked to this uh, this strong sense of teleology, which um, you know has been has been eroded by the sort of Darwinist Nietzschean. Um, um, you know, return to nature. It's, it's, it's not, you know, we're not just stuck in some sort of eternal cycle. That, that's the past that's been abolished. Yes, I mean, I, I, I'm not ashamed to say I believe in a grand narrative. I believe in the Christian grand narrative. And, and I, I believe that the, the material world, um, that both the material and the moral were poured forth from a single creative source. And that this whole mysterious process of, of physical existence is by some inexplicable uh, way related to its very source and significance at once um, material and sacramental in the sense that it is our very lives and the processes of them that are a kind of, provide a kind of divine pedagogy, if you will, for the processes and purposes which deliver a magnification of soul if we open our hearts to it. But I, I also believe that, that we can't make sense of this unless we, unless we accept the notion that as Pope John Paul II said, when God gives the gift of life, he gives it forever. And so the question then comes up, how does all this relate to the powers and possibilities in our biotechnology? Do we, do we thrust forward with our technology and aim to conquer death? I mean, maybe that's not a bad idea. I, I, I'm not worried about it by any sense, whether it's right or wrong, because to worry about that we might conquer death in an inappropriate way, in other words, break through the barrier of the cherubim with the flaming swords that protects the tree of life in Garden of Eden. You remember that, East of Eden. Um, so I'm not worried about it. It'd be sort of like worrying about a, that a better pole would put the pole vaulter into orbit or throw him over the moon. I think we aim to a death as an enemy, and we do the best we can. But then the question becomes, how, how do we focus our lives? Do we, 
do we focus them in a technological quest or do we give proper due, in my mind, to the spiritual meaning of our lives? And if we give a proper mind to the spiritual meaning of our lives, how does that relate to our relationship with death itself? Well, the, um, but you know, the question is sort of what, what the balance of all these things is. You know, how much evil science is going on? So you know, we're not interested in you know, turning people into zombies or vampires. And so it's not, we're not talking about the undead here. So there's obviously a lot of, lot of catastrophic approximations that are possible that we're not really interested in. Um, and you know, there's, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of bad science where it's not even science. It's, uh, it's sort of fake. It's uh, people promising things that, that don't happen. And that's, that's what I, I find myself much more concerned about. It's more yeah. stagnation than acceleration. But I, uh, I think there is also, you know, there's also the possibility for a lot of things that are you know, very good and positive that, that can still be done. I don't, I don't think that we're at the limit of um, scientific technological knowledge where everything beyond the limit is either fake or evil. Um, you know, it's not like, you know, it's, yes, 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 the, the Faust of, you know, of, um, 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 you know, the Faust of Goethe, it's evil science. The Faust of Marlowe, it's sort of bad science. It's not even science. Um, but the, 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 the choices that we have are not only between those two Fausts. There's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more we can do. There's obviously like, you know, a very complicated relationship between, um, you know, the Judeo-Christian inspiration and, um, and the sort of scientific logical conquest of mortality. I tend to think it's positively correlated. I don't think it's like some sort of uh, anti-christic parody. I think it's, it's it, you know, it happened in the West. It was, uh, and it was, and I think it happened, I think that one of the reasons we had, you know, the scientific technological impetus in our civilization was that we did not accept the pagan rationalizations that, uh, that death is natural, that uh, it's going to happen, that all that lives must die. That's, that's why it happened in our civilization. That's, that's sort of the intellectual history I would, I would tell. And what I'm alarmed about is not Frankenstein-like experiments today. I'm alarmed by how little people are trying to do. And I think that's, again, uh, correlated with this, uh, this decline of, uh, of, of the Judeo-Christian um, element in our society. So, uh, so I see them as very uh, positively linked. Obviously, intellectual history is always a super complicated thing, but uh, you know, it ha the the um, the idea that uh, science and technology had to work on this problem was something that happened in the uh, Judeo-Christian West and not anywhere else. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question as to how science emerged in the West and how medical science emerged. Of course, you probably all know the first hospitals were were set up as hospitality, uh, Christian homes, welcoming people who are traveling and then sick people. And it's also interesting the relationship between the, the Christian tradition and its, its metaphysical frame of existence. Francis, St. Francis, who was born in 1182, his, his whole sense of attention to the tiny things, not to the grand scheme of things only, but to the little particulars. Um, it said that his, that his brother said that he would walk along the, the road and he'd pick the worms off the cobblestones, say, brother worm, you must not go across the cobblestones, you get crushed. So Francis and Dominic interacted, and Dominic, of course, was the founding source of Aquinas, uh, the order Aquinas was in. And from, from those early processes, um, uh, Roger Bacon was a Franciscan, I believe, and Galvani, um, Faraday, I believe. Modern science emerged within that context, but it was also framed not just by a particular way of viewing the natural world, but the spiritual world as well. So the story of St. Francis is that he he was the son of a wealthy cloth merchant, and he was living a kind of frivolous life, I, I suppose what we would call today a, a kind of bon vivant or a, 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 maybe a playboy even. And, and he, but he kept noticing the poor in the alleyways and stuff. And one day, he was the son of a wealthy cloth merchant. He had lots of money. His father wanted him to have the dignity of nobility. And one day, Francis was going along the road and he came to a leper and he got down from his horse and he gave the leper a coin. And perhaps he tossed it at him because he had a huge 
dread of leprosy, as it was, which was common, by the way, in the Middle Ages in Europe. And then it, it said that he turned back and he embraced the man, desiring to love him just as God loved each of, just as Francis believed God loved him. And Francis said that from that moment, all that he dreaded became for him the source of a great sweetness. He'd overcome his deepest fears, including his fear of death, and now is free to live in the service of love. So I think it's the, that spiritual frame that makes possible Western attitudes toward technology and medicine. And I think that's a frame we need to keep if we were to successfully navigate modern biotechnology. Well, I, uh, if that's all right, I'd like to get to some of the questions. And uh, we have uh, some very good ones. Uh, and we'll do another round in, in, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, Peter, I, I think it was Peter mentioned that uh, both of you are, are, are Christian, as am I. Um, how does your Christian faith and your belief in eternal life alter your perspective on the resolution? If heaven exists, shouldn't efforts be focused on getting more people there rather than extending mortal life? Well, I, I, certainly, uh, I certainly don't think um, these things are exhaustive in any way. So I think you can do, you can do both, you know, and, uh, and, and certainly, uh, you know, um, the, uh, the, the default atheist alternative is to do neither, that uh, you're, not, you're not going to uh, worry about an afterlife and you're not, you don't think you can, you can do th anything, anything about this life. And you sort of start with the, uh, um, you know, the default atheist position ends up being Epicureanism. It's, um, you know, eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow you may die, um, and is, is, is a sort of complacency. And, uh, and so I think, um, again, I think these things are um, not alternatives. I think they're, they're positively linked. And uh, you can perhaps see it through the, the atheist version, where um, if you think you can't do something, you eventually give up. You, you don't try. And so I, I don't know, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how fast progress we're going to make. Uh, I, I don't, you know, um, I think obviously, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know if, I, I, don't, I think that uh, it's quite likely I will not live forever because of scientific and technological progress and uh, that it's something that, uh, that will benefit other people. If I thought that was the end of the story, if, if it was only the atheist project, it would collapse. You know, atheists are very motivated when they're young. I have nothing against atheists, I have nothing against old people, don't like old atheists. They, 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 they just don't, they don't work very hard anymore. So Peter, let me ask you, if you, you yourself have invested in some of these companies working on longevity research. If, if you, uh, hypothetically, because I don't think it'll be easy, but if, if you could extend the lifespan to two, three hundred years, um, Peter and I both are, are acquainted with, acquaintance with um, Aubrey de Grey, you've probably seen him as a long beard, looks like Methuselah, um, Rip Van Winkle. Aubrey de Grey, as I debated him in the Civic Center last year in San Francisco, and Aubrey is, says if he can just live 35 more years, he will live long enough so that longevity escape velocity will allow him to continue to live because advances will follow advances. And then he will live and he believes that it's possible that he could live to be a thousand. So let me ask you, Peter, how long would you live if technology theoretically could take you there? Well, I, le I, left, that, I left that as an open question, I, because I, 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 I was quite clear we don't know how much science or technology can do. We don't know what, what the limits are. I think it's a question we should be studying. I think it's, it's part of the decadence of our society that we are, we, we're, we're not really putting that much, you know, that much effort into it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's, it's easy to make, make, make uh, fun of Aubrey de Grey, but I, I don't think that's really, th that's really the zeitgeist. You know, our zeit the zeitgeist of our time, it's not Promethean science. It's, 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 he, he looks weird because it's so, so, uh, so far outside the zeitgeist. The zeitgeist is marijuana. It's opioids. It's <laughs> video games. It's, it's, um, it's narcoleptic drugs to lull us to, to, to sleep. It's to sort of spend our lives amusing ourselves to death. That's... That's the zeitgeist of our time. Yeah, I didn't mean to make fun of Aubrey de Grey, just to say what he says. But, and it's also true, Peter says, you know, we may, we may have a lot of technology, but we're, as, as they say, we're dying of deaths of despair now. But let me, let me, let me shift it back to you as a sort of the counter question. I, I think, um, you know, I think where these problems come to light, it's, it's, not, 
in the abstract. It's not, you know, do you get a pill that can make you live to 200 or 300 or 1,000? That, that's like a little bit too abstract and ideological way to frame it. I think it's, you know, um, can we do things concretely about cancer, about, uh, about dementia? Should we be doing more about these things? And, and I think all the concrete questions, you know, you know, just about all of them, the answer seems yes. Now, you know, there are probably some ethical limits. There are some, you know, there, there are some things that, you know, are, are fake treatments we shouldn't be doing. But, um, but directionally, you will always lose this debate if you, uh, on, on the specifics. So the general one makes me sound weird, so I'm not answering the general question. <laughs> but, uh, but on the specific ones, you also um, don't want to take the other side on any, yeah. on any of the specifics because that will make you look uh, very cruel. Yeah. We're not that interesting. We agree on too much. <laughs> well, let's see if we can sharpen some uh, okay. disagreements. Uh, disagreements. Um, here's another uh, question from one of our students. What is your view on the soul? Uh, this is for both. Is it eternal? Is it physical or metaphysical? The, the soul. Of the soul. Peter, you got that one. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's uh, man, the, the, these are all like slightly above, above the pay grade. I, I think that, uh, I, I think there's sort of a, um, you know, the, 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 the philosophy, the sort of philosophy answer on this is, uh, is this question about Cartesianism. Whether um, whether uh, you know we have both the material and immaterial mind body, whether they're sort of two different substances or or not, um, and I think uh, you know I, I I find the Cartesian arguments relatively compelling, even though philosophical arguments are not actually the way to to think about these things. Um, but uh, but you know so if, if you if you sort of shifted a little bit to the uh, the phenomenon of consciousness. Um, you know, it's almost as, as mysterious as, as the question of the soul. You know, we, we still, you know, we still uh, don't understand it. I think the, the biases are, are sort of in an eliminative materialist direction. And so I'm, I'm always contrarian, so I'm, I'm, I would be, you know, biased against it. You know, the way neurobiology research goes, it's always reductionist, it's, it's, uh, it's materialist. That's how you construct the experiments. And, uh, and I think we, we need to sort of uh, should, should remain open to the, the sort of Cartesian alternative. Yeah, I'm sympathetic with that. I mean, you know, we talk about living forever, but the truth is we have trouble curing toenail fungus. It's, it's amazing how little we know in medicine and how little we know in science. And we really literally have no idea where that sense of qualia, that sense of subjective awareness comes from that we call consciousness. But, and, and actually, if, if you talk with physicists, my brother has a PhD in physics, and I talk with him about these matters. I only understand about 2% of what he says. But, I mean, we're living in a huge mystery, actually. And we don't even know how matter relates to, to mind in the first place, whether somehow mysteriously the material world is grounded in, in ideas. I think, when I think of the soul, I think of more Aristotelian notions. The soul is the principle of life within the body, an organizing principle of being. But it's not eliminative materialism or physicalism. I, I think it's, it's a, a, a sense in which there is an element of us that is, that is truly immaterial in the sense that we exist in the mind of God. I mean, this idea is a philo of Alexandria in the f first century, and I, I think there's something to be said for that. Bill, here's one, here's one for you, um, <clears throat> addressed to you directly. Can Bill make a non-theological case for mortality? Well, why would I want to? <laughs> okay, let me make a non-theological um, account. I think it's possible that the material world with its trajectory of life, its limits, its pattern, has framed our meaning. And I think it does this for everybody. And in the sense that the exigencies and the opportunities of our life are intimately related to, to the, the time of our life in the, sense, um, in the sense that we're born, we, we live in this struggle of, of life, for the vast majority of people, they end up 
in some kind of relationship producing children. They're, they go from dependency to nurture and then back to dependency at the end of their life. A normal human lifespan allows all three categories of relational dynamics, child, parent, grandparent. We, we live in this poignancy of the drama of, of death and love where we feel ourselves drawn, and this is true even people who don't have children, they feel themselves drawn into the urgencies of the expression of love and they will give themselves in some kind of a love. So in that sense, I think you, you actually can make a case for some kind of non-theological notion, although everybody has some kind of a back, a priori sense of meaning. Most, most people want their lives to matter beyond the matter of their body. And, and in that sense, even if they only feel like they're living for the sake of the future of their culture, they want to leave some kind of good in the world. So, so, so I think you, you can sort of make that case. I think the case is more fully made if we see both the giving of our lives uh, in, on the earth as echoing the paradigm of what, of the magnification of soul to the ascent of spirit. That makes more sense to me. Man, Bill, you always make all these incredibly ugly Darwinist things sound so beautiful. And, uh, and th th we, should just, we should just, you know, not forget the ugliness. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't believe it works on a, on a meaning or motivation side, you know. Um, it's, does our mortality motivate us to work harder or does it demotivate us? I remember a conversation I had with my uh, granduncle. He was about 80 years old at the time. He'd been retired for 15 years. And it was like, you know, I could have gotten four PhDs in retirement, but uh, I didn't do it because I figured I wasn't going to live this long. And, uh, and I think that's, that, that sort of strikes me as, 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 as the way the motivational structure actually works. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's, it, it, uh, it, 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 you know, it's, there is no meaning in death. Um, there is no meaning in, 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 in Darwinism or, or, you know, you, Nietzsche tried, Darwin tried. This, this is not the way to go for us human beings. Peter, here's one for you. Um, Aren't you curious what's at the other end of that last breath? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we, we've got we've gotten a bu bu thank you we've gotten a bunch of questions about the uh, practical uh, consequences of uh, life extension and uh, would a society would that kind of a society be incredibly inegalitarian and. Uh, uh, exasperate some of the worst social trends that we've seen in, con in the contemporary West. Maybe that Peter, Peter can take that one first. Well, you know, there, there's of course this whole litany of uh, of, uh, of, of uh, cr criticisms that if you know people live too long, it would increase inequality. It would um, maybe they would get bored. Um, you know, maybe it wouldn't um, um, create enough space for young people to, to get new positions. There sort of are. There certainly is you know a, a long um, list of things like this we can hypothesize. Uh, I, I would, you know, I would submit these are all problems we want to have, rather than, um, you know, and um, and and that's 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 always, you know, what I what I'd like to do, you know, if 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 you're if you're talking to, you know, a five-year-old who says they're bored, you, you know, the answer is not, you know, I hope you're going to die soon, <laughs> um, 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 you know, and and um, you know, if you're if you're concerned about inequality, um, which I think is exaggerated as a problem, but. Let's let's say it's the single be-all, end-all, the most important problem in the world is inequality. Um, you know, the, the response is not well. Fortunately, everybody dies, so that's you know we're all equal in that. You know, that's that's not the correct response. So, uh, jumping back to what Peter's comment about evolution, I I'm really not framing my thinking that way, Peter. I I think, I mean. Dobzhansky said nothing in biology makes sense apart from evolution. Well, I also think nothing in human life makes sense apart from an awareness of God as our source and significance of being. So when I, when I make these kind of comments about how the, the meaning of our life is in some way wrapped up in the actual processes and the transactions of our life, I don't think of that because evolution made it. I think of that because that's the way God made the world. And in that sense, 
um, I don't, uh, I, I'm not trying to um, deny the, the anguish that is in, in the material world. The, the, the panorama of phylogeny is just f filled with, with cruelty and contingency and sorrow. I mean, it, it's, it's an amazing thing to look at it. You know, Darwin, some people think Darwin lost his faith because he, he, he saw that there was a kind of moth that lay, or wasp that laid its eggs in a living moth. The larvae hatched and the, they ate the living moth from the inside. But I, I don't think of life as coming only from cruel contingencies of evolution. I see it as, as uh, autopoetic that there was, that the destiny of life was in the molecules, that there was an unfolding process. And who knows what kind of hand of intervention in the formation of life. I'm just trying to make the point that I think with, even within the constraints of a, a secular perspective, there is something to be said for the given world and its, its frame of time. You know, in Brave New World, everybody cites Brave New World. You've got to be careful using Brave New World. But, but uh, if you haven't read it, by the way, I think you should. I'll, well, that's an assignment. Um, but there's a place in, in Brave New World where Lenina and Bernard are, are in their helicopter hovering over and they're, they're trying to decide what they're gonna do that night. And, and Lenina, typically jejune, she says, let's go play electromagnetic golf. And, and Bernard says, well, that would be a waste of time. And Lenina says, well, what's time for? Well, time is of the deepest significance, and I think it's within the frame of time that we start to understand who we actually are. Let me make, let me make one point in defense of Darwin. I'm against Darwinist ideology, but I think Darwin believed it much less than, 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 than you do. Um, and uh, one of the ways, the way I understand the actual, you know, sort of part of the motivation of Darwin, you know, um, for, for the origin of species, was um, you know these reflections on the cruelty of nature, and, and this this was why creationism, why intelligent design. Um, the problem with them was, from Darwin's point of view, was not primarily scientific. It was theological. It was, um, and you, you needed a theory where God was not that proximately involved in the mm -hmm. world, because um, you know it's sort, of, it's sort of like you know um, if, if if God created the HIV virus, then you'd say, well, that's that's uh, that's providential. That's good. Uh, if, if God did. If God was involved that specifically in the creation, um, it leads to um, a much greater problem of evil. And so, uh, so I think what uh, you know what motivated Darwin to come up with naturalistic explanations was to sort of um, shift the problem of evil away from from God. Um, and and um, and that that part of it I think makes sense. And that's why you know I think this, uh, the Darwinian story is broadly correct. Um, but uh, but it's it's his move was the exact opposite. It was never to look for meaning in. In, in, in those places, it was to really decouple it. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting comment, but I, I think we still are thrown back to the question of then how does the natural process of life relate to our spiritual purposes? And, and I mean, th there's a whole tradition in, in Christian history of s sacramentality, of the, the sort of high points of meaning that come through the, the actual material processes of life. Now, I mean, I, I'm perfectly, but, you, you yeah. keep you keep invoking nature, 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 and this was what I was, was trying to preempt with my you know with my opening comment that uh, it's 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 you know it, it it can be true it can be the case that all that lives must die like you know the evil um, mother Gertrude says or it can be an alibi for us ignoring some cultural problems in our society and I I I, I want to keep submitting that um, you, we need to take this this alibi more seriously you know that it is it is. Um, you know, there's, there's sort of a sense in which we, we're in this period of secular stagnation in the West. You know, living standards are not rising anymore. It's, it's, you know, it's much broader than just, than just biotechnology. And, the, the, you know, the generational question, you know, for, for the boomers, you know, eventually for people in my generation, Gen X, you know, the generational question is, why didn't we do more? Why didn't we do more to leave our society in a better place than, than we had it since, you know, since the Enlightenment? You know, one of the ways... Um, the wor our society worked generationally was that parents uh, um, expected their kids to do better than themselves. 
it stopped with the boomers. It stopped with your generation, or you know, you're the, I guess you're not, you're, you're the generation that comes after you, Bill. And and um, Gen X is making the same same mistake. Um, that's and and then we we were, we we're desperately looking for these alibis to to excuse um, to excuse this failure. And uh, and you know the, the the biggest alibi is always we couldn't have done more. We couldn't do better. And uh, and that's that's why I'm sort of I, I want to always really push back against that. Well, that's good. I'm a doctor too. I don't. I'm not in favor of those alibis, and I I'm not in favor of this. Essentially, the implicit killing that goes into taking that attitude, where you accept death. That's that's not my point. But but I still believe that that there is meaning within the material world. I mean, there's some threads of Christian history that believe that all of time and space and material being are not out of God's purview, not out of God's plan, but the arena of redemption, that the very process of our journey through life with all of its struggles and troubles and death itself is a participation in a process of re-identifying, re-establishing our unity with God's nature that it's, it's in this drama of, of love and death that we relocate ourselves, not that we relocate ourselves, but we re restore our sense of unity with God in recognizing our dependence on God. That, to me, that, that is what makes sense of it. Otherwise, you, you feel like somehow it's escaped the orbit of God's purposes, and yet the whole sense of the incarnation is that the, the world was somehow the arena for the apprehension of love. I mean, Christ would have meant nothing to a troop of chimpanzees. It took human beings with their capacity to re relate, to feel in the other empathic capacities. It took human beings to understand God. So in a sense, creation culminates with a creature who can apprehend their creator, but more importantly, it set the arena for the condescension or descent of God into the world to transform the world's purposes, allowing henceforth a participation in the very purposes of God. It's the incarnation and then, of course, the resurrection that, that delivers to humanity the, the solution. It, it, I mean, in a strange sense, the material world poses a question it can't answer. How can there be both in the realm of, a, of an omniscient, and omnipotent, and benevolent God, how can there be both suffering and love? And the answer to that is not some kind of theodicy, some kind of rational explanation. It's the presence of God on the world to, to draw us in and, and make that dynamic of struggle, suffering, and death into meaning. He restores the intelligibility of the cosmos. Cosmos means an ordered whole. Interesting, the word cosmos in Greek carries about it the meaning of beauty as well. But, but now we're sliding back to Greek philosophy. Cosmos is not a biblical concept. The word nature does not occur once in the entire Old Testament. You know, so, uh, so I think, I think you know, um, yes, we can, from the pagans, we can take some science, we can take um, you know, some of the things they developed, we should not be taking their, their pagan philosophy, um, and we should not be exporting that into, into Christianity. So, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of the Hobbesian word for it was Aristotle, -y, which is the sort of horrific synthesis of Aristotle and, you know, um, medieval Catholicism, and I feel that's, 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 that's what we're getting. You know, the, um, you know, even if everything that you, you say is, is correct and on some level, um, even I think it's you know it's 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 all like this this, this weird conflation of uh, Greek and Christian thought. Um, it's it's not that what I'd want to hear from you if I was your patient, you know. <laughs> I um, and um, and I don't I don't think that's unreasonable that you know if, if if I'm seeing a doctor I want them to to work on curing me. And if I if I heard the speech that you just heard, even if it's all true, as a patient, uh, I, I would think that you weren't doing your job. Well, that raises the issue of what the role of the physician actually is. And, and we're, we could, as physicians, use a lot of different technologies. But as I mentioned in my opening comments, it seems to me 
that the role of the Christian physician is to apply only those technological answers to questions that comport with the highest purposes of human life, with the purposes of love. And I think that, that's where... But again, how, how much... Like you're, you're, the question is, how much of it is like that? Is if, if all of science is like that, then we should go straight to your, your, your theological speech for every patient. Every, th every single thing you can do is fraudulent or evil. Therefore, just... Um, you know, get ready for your afterlife. I don't see why so, that is. So, no, but, but you, because you're, you're always going to the negative things. You know, it's, 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 it's Frankenstein experiment. It's all these things that are, that are, that are, that are wrong. And, uh, and I think, you know, the, the, the concern, and I'm not trying to make this ad hominem anyway, you know, the concern is that this is, you know, this is the general attitude of our, of our culture, of our society. It's, you know, there's nothing we can do, and so we stop trying. And that's, that is what I see as the dominant zeitgeist of our, of our time. Well, I certainly don't believe there's nothing we can do. I think there's a great deal we not only can do, but need to do. And I'm very in favor of biomedical research, and I'm very in favor of new therapies emerging. But I do think that we have to develop them and apply them only within the context of some larger vision of what life is for, lest we degrade the very humanity we're trying to heal. Well, again, look, the question is, you know, the question is how much you know, do we need to be worried about that versus how much do we need to be worried about, about the stagnation? I, if I had to put numbers on it, I would say it's, you know, 99% fake stagnation, 1% maybe Frankenstein research. That's, that's, the way, that's the way I would quantify it. And, um, and you know, you're, all, you're doing your side a disservice when you always go straight to the um, evil Frankenstein arguments. Um, you know, one of the reasons the social conservatives lost the stem cell debate was because um, you know they framed it as evil science, and it should have been framed. If you wanted to win the debate, you were supposed to frame it as bad science. You know, you inject stem cells in people, they get cancer. It doesn't work. It's bad science. It's not even science. That's the way the conservatives won the art debates in the 90s. It's not even art. It's bad art. It's not even science. It's bad science. Once you conceded that it was evil science, that you know, um, everyone thought, wow, it's really going to work. And therefore, we should uh, we should push it really really harder. That's that's the way the actual history of the of, of the Bush Bioethics Council worked. It accelerated, um, it accelerated these developments because it um, it conceded the most important point, which was that it actually worked, and that was that was the point that should have been questioned much more. Well, we're achieving well, some we're excellent differentiation uh, uh, here, and uh, I will. Uh, if I, Bill wants to take it, please. I, I got to answer that yes, because, yeah. I mean, I. Peter, I, th I think, is actually not representing my position during the stem cell debate properly. He knows very well that I, I was the guy on the President's Council that said, made a defense of both the science and the moral principles that, that were in tension, and that I put forward a proposal to solve it so that the goods of both sides could be met. I, you know, it may be just sort of where, where you live and where I live. I, I, I live entirely almost entirely in a medical center. And so I, I speak, you speak to the philosophical social errors and I think of, I, I'm cautious, like a good physician, above all do no harm, I'm cautious at the level of the kind of thinking that underlies the biomedical agenda. But I'm certainly mostly in favor of what's going on. And by the way, I, I do not have hostility toward my colleagues at, at Stanford or any other medical center. I think they're, for the most part, very virtuous people, very dedicated to what they're doing. I'm very in favor of biomedical science. I just think that it needs to be framed within something other than the current secular concepts of what life is and where it came from, including, by the way, the Darwinist But, but we, need, we need to always go back to this question of how much of it is, is fake versus evil versus, versus good. And let me submit to you that the, the uh, you know, an idea that's really taboo is this idea that a lot of it is, is fake and problematic. Uh, you know, one of, um, one, of my, um, one of the people I've gotten to know at Stanford was uh, this professor, uh, Bob Laughlin. He got a Nobel Prize in physics in the late 90s. And uh, uh, he suffered from the supreme delusion that once he had a Nobel Prize in physics, he would have academic freedom and uh, that he could therefore research any area he wanted to. And, you know, he decided to research an area that was far more controversial than, let's say, you know, questioning climate science or questioning evolutionary theory. 
he decided to start by investigating uh, how much research was actually being done by his fellow colleagues at Stanford. And um, um, his basic premise was, um, was that uh, they were all stealing money from the government, uh, they were all engaged in fraudulent research. Um, it sort of started, um, you know, they decided, they, you know, they were sort of, you know, again, he thought he, you know, he won the Nobel Prize, so he had a right to have a little bit more leeway and freedom. So it started with, uh, and they decided to go after the Stanford Biology Department first. So they thought that was like uh, the, the most degenerate part of the, the, the scientific uh, world. And, you know, it sort of, um, you know, you sort of can imagine how the movie ended. Uh, you know, it sort of, uh, it devolved into, you know, he, um, he was no longer able to get any funding. Nobel Prize didn't protect him. His uh, graduate students couldn't get PhDs. Those got vetoed by other faculty. And, uh, and you know, I, when I first heard of uh, Laughlin's thing, I thought, you know, this is kind of a crazy thing to, to say and, and suggest. But, uh, you know, whenever, whenever you have ideas that can't be asked or can, can't be questioned, um, you know, you have to suspect there might be more, more truth to them than, uh, than, uh, than, 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 than not. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're spending like crazy amounts. You know, we're getting very little out. Um, you know, even on the on the stem cell thing, where uh, it's 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 not translated into therapies, or you know the uh, the genomics revolution in the late 90s, it was supposed to translate uh, quickly. It's been you know maybe something's about to happen, but it's it's again 20 years 20 years later, and uh, it's you know the, the 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 real problem you know that I keep coming back to is not that much is going on, and that is that is the really taboo, that is the really forbidden idea to articulate. You say that you get sidelined even if you have a Nobel Prize in physics. So you think, Peter, that, that uh, the, basically that the biomedical science community is not pursuing the, the avenues of opportunity or, or, I mean, my perspective is quite different on that. I, I, first of all, I think there's a, we're right at the threshold of vast increases in the power of operation in biotechnology, mainly through advances that will follow CRISPR-Cas9, the new gene editing tool. And I welcome that because there are at least 10,000 single cell, um, single gene diseases that have 90% of them have no treatment or cure whatsoever. And some of them are horrible, including Leshnihan's disease where the children chew their fingers off. But I look at the community and I'm pretty well in touch with what's going on at Stanford and quite a bit of the, of, of, of the general national and international science, and I, I, I see a great deal of work at the very cutting edges of what's possible. I don't see people saying, maybe there's not quite enough opportunity for unconventional attitudes. Well, but, but we've been, we've, this, this is what they've been saying for 50 years. We're five years away from curing cancer. It's just well, around it's, the corner. That's it's and, very and, and hard you have to cure cancer. You know, yes, I, I agree. This is what people say. This is, the, this is the propaganda narrative they have to tell because you're, you're in a Malthusian struggle against your fellow scientists to get money from the government. And the way that Malthusian struggle works is you lie and exaggerate more than your fellow scientists. And, and we can That's then true. ask how big the discount is that we need to attach to it. But surely we have to attach you know, we have to attach some, um, some sort of discount. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've, I've invested, like, on, on, as an investor, I've invested both, you know, in IT and I've invested some in biotech. Biotech is much harder and it's just, and you know, one of the problems you run into in biotech investing that you don't run into in, on the IT side is there is just a crazy amount of stuff that is borderline fraudulent. You know, it, it doesn't quite work the way people represent it. And, um, and if you, and if you don't ask the fraud question, you know, you're, you're, you're really, um, and again, fraud, I mean, you know, lying to others, lying to yourself, it's all these different permutations. But that's, uh, you know, I, 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 you know and, and again, there's always, whenever we talk about the stagnation, there's always a tendency to shift the topic to the near future. It's about to accelerate. It's about to take off really fast. Um, it's just around the corner. And, um, and you know, that's, that's harder to evaluate. I think it's easier to evaluate you know, the, the progress we've had in the last 40, 50 years, and that's been, that's been slower and harder than before, and we can then get into these complicated public policy debates, why that is, is it, you know, is it nature, again, is it, is it that it's, it's actually gotten harder, the low-hanging fruit's been picked, or is it, is it that there's something wrong with, you know, with, with culture, with the funding, you know, um, almost no grants go to younger scientists, you know, when you know, it's scientists under age 40 that uh, discover, make most of the big discoveries. 2% of NIH grants go to scientists under age 40. That seems like a little bit off. You have a peer review process where, um, where anything heterodox can't get funded. You have, um, you have sort of a publisher-perish dynamic where you have to do small incremental things to publish lots of 
um, articles that don't add up to anything ever. Um, and, um, and, and, and so I, I do think we can, we can explore a lot that's, that's wrong with you know, the culture of, of science. And, and again, my, my sort of libertarian cut on, on what happened would be you know, the history was that we had, uh, you know, we had a healthy scientific world that was non-governmental, it was decentralized, it was idiosyncratic, different people were doing different kinds of things. And in the 1930s, 19, 1940s, it got centralized and accelerated. And the Manhattan Project was the big impetus um, space program. And, um, and, you, and there was actually a way you could accelerate science temporarily by adding tons of money and centralizing. The New York Times editorial, 1945, a week after Hiroshima, was, um, you know, um, hopefully, um, um, you know, we, uh, people will no longer, they will no longer be able to complain. And talking about libertarians who say that uh, the army can't just tell scientists what to do and get things done. If you'd left it to the prima donna scientists, it would have taken them 50 years to bring this invention to the world that the army could get them to do in three and a half years. So the centralization um, worked, but to use an ecological metaphor, it, it worked by creating a monoculture. And that monoculture, and we're now two generations in to where um, that monoculture has been, you know, has, has, has been just catastrophic. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's not a healthy ecosystem at all anymore. Well, you know, Peter, I got to answer oh, that. Know, Peter, I, I, I'm, this is great. I, I think you ought to, I think you ought to, I'm going to propose you to take over the FDA uh, now that God has left, and, and maybe the NIH. I mean, I think Peter's right. There could be vast changes, and, but I have to also say this, that, that the, my colleagues in the biomedical uh, research community are, are, are very intelligent, very sincere and very earnest to do good. It's one of the one of the problems that that people generally have is they don't appreciate the complexity of biology, which is why I started my comments about the the, the intrinsic difficulty of it. When I I was as you heard, I was educated at Stanford Medical School, and my my biochemistry teachers, but two of them, Paul Berg and Arthur Kornberg at Nobel Prizes, I sat there and I listened to where the future could go. And it was astonishing to think of what might be coming in the next 50 years. And, and yet, as I went through my clinical training, I realized, uh-oh, this is a little more complicated than the textbook version of it. So I chose not to invest in biotechnology whenever I had any money. Here, I'm giving you some investment tips, Peter. Um, <laughs> when I had money, I put it into, into more information technologies and electronics and so forth because I realized it was it was linear whereas biology is networks and it's exceedingly complex I knew that yeah you could invest in things like like screening and you know lab apparatus but if you're going to invest in in clinical therapies you're going to have to run against all the complexities of this strange creature that is so variable that you can barely make predictions, and therefore it's very hard to get through the, the FDA. And, and so my, my point is only this, just you mentioned the stem cell. Why haven't we got, you know, cures for 143 million people like they promised 15 years ago? Well, Peter's absolutely right. It was grantsmanship. It was full of hype. The reason we don't have those cures is because it never was going to happen, no matter how well-ordered the research was. It, it was. it was grantsmanship in the sense that one domain of science wanted to control more money. And that happens all over the place. And so therefore, they overpromised what it could produce. I very, was very good friends with another Nobel laureate, Baruch Blumberg. And as this was going on, he kept saying to me, Everybody needs to calm down. It's not going to work this way. I've seen it too many times. And that's the truth. I mean, biology is really, really hard. That's why we've done a lot in physics. We've done a lot in chemistry. You know, now we're entering the era of developmental biology. We've sequenced the genome. We're now figuring out how the organism is put together. But it's really something else. It's not easy. But, but, and yeah, go ahead. But you know, you're saying two slightly different things, and I want to sort of disentangle them a little bit. Is biology political or is it hard? And um, maybe it's both. Um, and I'm sympathetic to the idea that it's you know extraordinarily political, and you have grantsmanship, and you have all sorts of you know cool de socks that you get people uh, revved up on. You know, the complexity question, the hardness question, 
you know, I, I would submit as a bit more of an open question. And, um, you know, it's obviously, you know, in some sense, it's, 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 it's very different from chemistry and physics. Um, I don't think, you know, I, 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 my, my sort of proof that it can't be quite as complex as you, you make it out to be is, you know, you have 50 trillion cells in a human being, and you say, well, how can you get all these cells to fit together? And if you do the combinatorial math, you, you know, it's like it would require a computer the size of the universe to calculate that, and, and um, nobody can ever figure that out. And yet, um, we know there's a, you know, moderately complex, not that, not, you know, universe scale computer complexity. There's a moderately complex algorithm or something like that that must do that, and, 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 and life is the proof for this. This is, you know, there are all these sort of, um, you know, it's, it's, if you, if you, and if you t take too reductionist approach, an approach, it will look too complicated. If you think of it in terms of, you know, if you think of biology in terms of chemistry, it's unbelievable that anything works at all. You'd think there'd be all sorts of crazy confounding reactions and, uh, and um, you know, it, it, it shouldn't work and you, we could have all these proofs that, you know, the origin of life is impossible, but, you know, more generally that life is impossible. And so I think the fact that we're here, um, you know, if there's a scientific explanation for it, I would submit it's one of only moderate complexity and, um, and that the question we have to take more seriously is, is just, you know, is there something you know, is there something really, really wrong with this? One of, one of, uh, one of um, this, is, this is a little bit, the, the, you know, the ad hominem critique would be, you know, do we have less talented people going into biology than other, other fields? You know, if, it's, if, if, you, if you need math to do it, uh, one, of my, one of my biology scientist friends uh, said, you know, well, it's, um, you know, it's, um, you know I, I'm a biologist because I have bad math genes. So we have sort of this Darwinian selection process for uh, people with bad math genes. Now, the hope is that that's not what it's gonna take. But, uh, but I think we have to ask all these questions about, is it simply the complexity versus is it, you know, the politics, the sociology, all these other factors that may, may go into it? One more, believe it or not, we're running out of time. Oh, let's um, just keep so, going, it's but, fun. Yeah, you, you guys are modeling a very robust uh, intellectual discussion that we like to see at the Abigail Adams Institute, so thank you very much, and at ISI. Uh, Peter, this one's for you, an invitation to speculate. Uh, shifts the ground a little bit. Um, if human beings plan our lives around a narrative schema, will the lack of an end lead many from existentialism to nihilism? Uh, well, I um, well, I think um, again, I, uh, you know, end is a is a is sort of an ambiguous word. So it's always you know end you know end of history the end of science, the end of X, um, the end of something, it always means, you know, end can always mean uh, termination or a culmination. And, uh, and so we have to always, I think you start by disambiguating the word. And so, uh, so if, um, and so does end as, culm as termination mean, um, um, you know, end in terms of um, all these other ways? Um, and I think they're, they're 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 very very different, and so I think it's uh, that that's why I that's why I try to um, that's why I try to frame things in this more teolo teleological sense that it's uh, it's um, you know there, there's sort of some orientation to the future. It's when we lose that that you have both existentialism and nihilism. My 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 suspicion is that when you have an end in the sense of termination, that's um, that's actually the problem because that that destroys teleology. But it's always, uh, we have to always disambiguate, to be, disambiguate that word. Bill, one more for, for you, or uh, do you want to take a crack at, at, at that one as no, well? I really agree with Peter about teleology. You know, Darwinism mm -hmm. is very negative about teleology, and I think it, everybody operates with a, with a story in their life, and I think it's just silly to, to displace. You know, there's a saying about, it's not a very nice say, saying, but I heard it from a Catholic cardinal, so I'll tell you. He said, that teleology is like a woman of ill repute, repute, okay? Teleology is like a woman of ill repute. Nobody wants to be seen with her during the day, but many use her at night. Maybe we should uh, wrap it up on that, on that, on that note. That's, uh, that's, a good, that's a good one. Uh, why don't we do that? There, I didn't even know there was a car there behind us somewhere, but something is... Uh, Happening. Let me uh, let me invite uh, you, Peter or Bill if they want to uh, wrap it up or say uh, something else in, in, in conclusion. One What's last that? Question. Do you want one for you? Yeah, no, one I got, one I got one. This one's very good. But if you want it? Okay. All right. One more for Bill. Prof to Professor Hurlbut. What difference is there 
between dying of a geriatric disease at 80 or dying at 22 because of tuberculosis. If I should be permitted to take life-saving medicine in the case of the latter, what should prohibit me of taking life-saving medicine in the case of the former? Nothing. I'm, I'm in favor of people trying to live as long as they can. And by the way, I do not think we should reduce this discussion to a therapy versus enhancement. I think there are perfectly legitimate uses of enhancement in human existence. For example, if a surgeon were to take a drug to steady his hand while he operates on the eye of a child, to make a very sentimental case, I think that's a legitimate use of enhancement, even if it takes something a week or two or a month off of the surgeon's life if the, if the purposes are serious. I, I actually think that, that we should pursue the, the, the cures of things, and I think we should figure out how to use biotechnology for things beyond therapy that are clearly coherent with the ethical good. But for both of those frames, you have to ask yourself, what is it we're aiming? What are we doing? I mean, keeping life alive is obviously a good thing if that life has within itself a, a coherence of purpose. I mean, there, as, as I said at the beginning, there are certain senses in which the, the cure is worse than the disease, and I, we're learning that in the intensive care units now, and we, we've sort of making our way through that. And, but, but here's the larger point, and this is coming back to our original thesis here. Technology should regard death as the final enemy. I believe that death is the enemy. I believe that, that I believe that, that life is about life, that, that death is something that needs to be conquered. But I don't believe that it will be conquered by technology. I think we can help. We use our technology in the coherence of our larger spiritual frame. But in the final end, I believe in something that's very unpopular to believe in, in a place like the one I work in. And that is that, that life has a transcendent purpose. And that we, we align our technology the, in the best way we can with that purpose. Now I mentioned um, new gene editing tool CRISPR-Cas9. I, I, I'm doing a project with, with uh, uh, Jennifer Doudna who discovered that technology and she's a very good person in my, my experience. She's very concerned about the proper use of it. And she realizes, as do many of my colleagues, that we're venturing now into territory where the powers of operation on human life are going to be vast. And I think, Peter, I think you're going to find they really could, could in the proper political environment, advance very rapidly because the tools are so much greater. I'll just, just take a moment and give you an example of how great the tools are. I'm friends with Rudolf Janisch, who made the first transgenic mouse, and it, he told me that it took him two years, a postdoc, of course, two years, $200,000, and he altered one gene. And recently told me he can do that same operation for $2,000 in three weeks, and he can change six to eight genes at a time. That is more than a quantum leap. That's an astonishing advance. That's going to filter in at every level of bio, bio medical inquiry, it's going to rapidly uh, illuminate and it, the basic mechanisms of things, the way they have tractable um, engagement, sort of like our, our new genetically engineered approaches to cancer. It's just the beginning. I mean, as I said, we've just barely stepped off of Plymouth Rock. But I, I still will hold to my thesis here, and I'm not, I'm not um, negative about technology, and I'm and I hope I'm not hysterical about its dangers, but when you get the capacity to operate at so many levels of human life as will emerge in the next half a century, you have to have a frame of ethics to, fra to, to set it in its proper course. Otherwise, the ambitions and appetites that are open-ended, human desire is so dangerous in some senses and so wonderful in others. That's, that's an equation for degradation disaster as much as it is for, for aspiration and exaltation. All of this has to be ordered with some sense of meaning and purpose of human life. And it's, I'll, I'll finish on this. There's a saying that, that um, 
we can do what we do, but Mother Nature always bats in the bottom of the ninth. And I think we need to take that seriously. And another saying, this is my last comment, um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a, a saying that the first principle of intelligent tinkering is to never throw away any of the parts. Well, we certainly don't want to throw away the parts that are the physical basis of our freedom, our extraordinary human capacities. But neither do we want to throw away those parts that are the aesthetic, philosophical, theological foundation that makes that freedom truly free. The preservation of our civilization may depend on this. Peter, final word. Well, I, uh, Look, I think I think we're just going to have to agree to disagree. I think I think the problem is one I of stagnation. No, no, no. no I, th I think the the problem is one of stagnation, and um, and you know it's it's uh, I, I think I, th I think the sort of uh, the sort of accelerating um, narrative is just not believed by people anymore. I mean, there's a Silicon Valley version of this. Let's frame the context a little bit differently. Where um, you know Silicon, this, this is the reason Silicon Valley is sort of culturally, politically in trouble in this country is because they have been. There's been this Google propaganda, this accelerating, the story of accelerating technology. They've been talking about self-driving cars for 10 years, and you know I'm not sure how important self-driving cars are, but uh, it's uh, it's been 10 years. Not much, you know, the progress has been anemically slow, and uh, and I think this is uh, this is sort of this is the sense in which. Um, you know uh, the, the the broader public is um, is is getting more skeptical of of the things the scientific and technological community is telling them because and they, because they rightly sense it's been too much propaganda it's it it it, it it's, it's 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 not actually uh, this does not mesh with people's common sense experience with with the way they see their their day day to day lives um, and. Uh, and that's that's why you know I think again we're you know we're not in a you know we're not in a Promethean science moment like at Los Alamos in 1945. We're in the opposite world. We're in an Epicurean world of stagnation, um, you know, bureaucratization, politicization, and uh, and that's the that's the cultural battle that uh, that I, I I believe we need to fight first and foremost to 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 to, um, to reverse the decline of the West. Before uh, you join me in thanking our uh, debaters for uh, an excellent conversation, I would like to thank you for your questions. We couldn't get to all of them. We at the Abigail Adams Institute privilege big questions, bold questions, adventurous questions, and uh, uh, thank you for those. There are many others uh, here <laughs> as well. Uh, but I also like to um, uh, commend the uh, debaters not for, of course, their brilliant minds, but they're also very rhetorically able and, and skilled, uh, skilled uh, uh, debaters. So that was uh, very nice to see as well. Um, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you again to the ISI uh, and to the D um, Diana Davis Spencer Foundation for making this possible. Have a good evening. Thank you.